Argentina commemorates the 40th anniversary of the Malvinas War. Pope Francis urged Malta's authorities to respond to the worsening migration crisis in the country due to the war in Ukraine. This Saturday, Ramadan festivities began around the world, one of the most important dates in the Muslim calendar. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Terrestrial Studios in Havana, Cuba. We are going to begin with the news, and we are going to do so in Argentina. Uh, the people in Argentina are commemorating this Saturday the 40 years of the Malvinas War. The veterans, their families, and the people start the day with vigils in different parts of the country. On the eve of this commemoration, Argentinian President Alberto Fernandez and several members of his cabinet have reaffirmed that the Malvinas are Argentinian and will continue as they have done since 1833, to claim their sovereignty. Santiago Gafeiro, the head of the Argentinian diplomacy, assured that their relations between Buenos Aires and London will always be tense, as long as the British refuse to talk about the sovereignty of the islands. For his part, the head of state, Alberto Fernandez, assured that the claim of the Argentinian people is also inspired by the memory of the dead, who do not allow them to live in peace, and assured that defending colonies is a shameful act. The government of Peru announced that it will be abide by any decision of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights on whether former President Alberto Fujimori should remain in prison, despite a court ruling allowing his release. Peruvian prosecutor Carlos Miguel Reaño pointed out that the Peruvian state recognizes the rights of victims whose human rights were affected during Alberto Fujimori's administration. Meanwhile, he affirmed that the decision of the Human Rights Court will be implemented by the state in the most expeditious manner possible. The human rights entity ratified on Friday that request to the Peruvian justice system not to release former President Fujimori from prison until the court resolved the provisional measures requested by the victims of the Barrio Saltos and La Cantuta massacres. In Paraguay, the Commandant General of the Military Academy, General Cesar Guillermo Garcia, was dismissed after allegation of torturing cadets. In the midst of the turmoil caused by the allegations of torture made by cadets of the Paraguayan Military Academy, President Mario Abdo Benitez removed the commander of the military institution from his duties. In his place, he appointed Brigadier General Alcides Lovera Ortiz and designated Colonel Edgar Carneiro Cauto as commander of the cadet corps. The changes were implemented in response to reports of mistreatment and physical abuse suffered by students, which led to family members and friends to file an anonymous complaint. Costa Ricans are set to vote in a second and final round of presidential elections on Sunday with many voters hoping for strong hands to leave their country out of economic situations. Voters of the Caribbean country are trying to pick a leader between their former president from the 1990s and a, world for, world, and a former World Bank economist. The country's next president will have a monumental task on his hands, with foreign debt totaling more than two-thirds of the country's GDP, worsening poverty rates and high unemployment, with opinion polls quite evenly split between the two candidates. The battle over mo money might turn out to be the winner hand to move Costa Ricans borders at the ballot box this Sunday. Around 600 migrants who began a caravan from Tapachula to Mexico City on Friday clashed with National Guard agents resulting in dozens of arrests and injuries on both sides. The group which seeks to reach the north to cross into the United States encountered a first checkpoint of agents of the National Migration Institute and guards. Authorities and activists reported that the forces of law and order were overpowered by the migrants, who after some pushing and shoving managed to continue their march. Although in smaller numbers only to find themselves a few kilometers ahead with a second operation, faced with the blockade the caravan reacted by throwing sticks and stones but was dispersed with tear gas according to local media images and activist complaints. The Mexican government strategy has been to set up checkpoints along the migrant's path to stop their advance.
and Havana is hosting the first local development fair where more than 3,000 exhibitors of all types of economic management meet to show their work, make business contacts and share their experiences. More details from our Havana correspondent Lisandra Andres. 720 economic entities come together for the first time in Cuba in a sales expo. State institutions, micro, small and medium-sized enterprises, cooperatives and self-employed workers take advantage of this venue to create alliances, launch products and services, and strengthen cooperation with domestic and foreign companies. Handicrafts, school materials and furniture, garden, food, all these and more can be found at the fair. One of the most important things is the alliance with state companies, with state companies that you can change backward and forward. We have just signed, for example, a contract with the Office of the Historian for the supply of some of our products to their stores, and right now they are launching a candy made by the Chocolate Museum that is using some of our dehydrated products as filling. It is a clear example of how many things can be done. It attracts also the visitors' attention, the exhibitors related to the technological field as is the case of the local development project Macrecitos, which for six years has been working in the world of robotics and providing workshops to children and young people in six provinces of the country and in the special municipality of the Isle of You. Our courses are filled by capacity mainly because of the novelty of the subject. Besides, when we were giving courses at Finca de los Monos, comrades from the Ministry of Education attended to see how to do the courses as pilots for a new robotic subject that will be implemented in all schools in the country. Basic design, digital manufacturing, programming and electronics. Creation of handmade robots with recycled materials such as PVC, cardboard, cans and bottles are some of the subjects of these courses. The objective is that children stop being simple consumers of technology. Today many children use their cell phones a lot just to play. However, with our courses, they learn how things work. That it's not just buying things to play with, but that they can use those things to develop new products. In the technology field, we have the guys from Cuban Engineers, a software and design development company which is committed to attracting international projects to the Cuban market, establishing alliances with other entrepreneurs and guaranteeing attractive job opportunities for professionals on the island. We are focused on finding those good professionals who want to have the opportunity to develop from their countries software of excellence for Cuba and for the rest of the world, and who feel that they can get economic benefits in a stable and present work environment without having to emigrate to another country. The event, which will last until April 3rd, brings together a good part of the economic actors of the territory. Here, according to its participants, they talk about local development, progress, strategies, but above all about how to build a country where the linkages between the different forms of management are a reality that produces goods and services. Lisandra Andres, Telesur, La Habana, Cuba. We're taking a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back to From the South. Pope Francis urged Malta's authorities to respond to the worsening migration crisis in the country due to the war in Ukraine. The Holy Father expressed before the President of Malta, George Vela, at the Italian's Palace of the Valletta the necessary support of different countries in the world to face the migratory crisis in Ukraine. Pope Francis reiterated that several nations have reaffirmed indifference to the problem and also declared the guerrilla atmosphere coming from Eastern Europe. He also condemned the actions of the leaders of both Moscow and Kiev for the armed conflict, which he described as pretensions of nationalist interests that foment war and which has led to about 4.1 million Ukrainians to flee the country. The president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, thanked his Turkish counterpart Recep Tayyip Erdogan for his contribution to the recent rounds of negotiations with Ukraine. Though a telephone call, the president discussed issues of bilateral interest, including humanitarian aspects in the context of the ongoing special Russian military operation in Ukraine. President Putin also highlighted Erdogan's government's efforts to achieve peace and his willingness to 
arranged a meeting with the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. President Erdogan, for his part, thanked the Russian Defense Ministry for its efforts to evacuate Turkish vessels and people in combat zones. On Friday, the Russian Defense Ministry condemned an alleged Ukrainian airstrike on an oil base outside of Belgorod said to have set the depot ablaze. There was no independent confirmation of details about the incident. The ministry also shared footage of a Bastion mobile coastal missile system in action, saying that the high-precision Onyx missiles destroyed a UAF command center. 5 a.m. Moscow time, April 1st, two Ukrainian Mi-24 helicopters entered the Russian Federation airspace at an extremely low altitude. The Ukrainian helicopters raided a civilian oil storage facility located in the outskirts of Belgorod for the missile strike. Several reservoirs were damaged and caught fire from missile hits. Let me stress that the facility served for supplying petroleum to civilian transport only. The oil base has nothing to do with the Russian armed forces. Pressure by the international community sanctions over the special operation for the denazification and demilitarization of Ukraine, Russia uses Europe's dependence on gas to protect its economy while negotiations between Moscow and Kiev move forward. Our news ally Brazil de Fato reports the following. The United States and the European Union are seeking to further tighten their grip on the Russian economy by creating a working group to reduce dependence on Russian oil and gas, one of the main obstacles in efforts to isolate Russia economically. For his part, Russian President Vladimir Putin announced that as, as of March 31st, payments for gas supplies to hostile countries to Moscow will have to be made in rubles in order to protect the Russian economy from Western restrictions. For political scientist Keisha Lemus, the Russian measure seeks to negotiate new terms in the short term. Russia is now taking this step to strengthen its currency. The feasibility of this measure, in my opinion, and some analysts also point this out, is questionable, because the contracts do not foresee this commercial transaction in currencies other than the euro or the dollar. So, these contracts really need to be renegotiated, and this renegotiation, Moscow may try to put some kind of barrier to gas supply or try to have some economic gain, impose some cost to Europe and also bring some economic gain to a renegotiation of these contracts. G7 and European Union countries have reacted by declaring that they will not comply with Russia's demand. German Finance Minister Robert Habeck said that all G7 ministers agree that this is a clear unilateral breach of existing contracts. After a meeting with other G7 finance ministers, Habeck emphasized that the demand for payment in rubles was unacceptable. On Wednesday, March the 30th, Germany issued a warning of a possible gas shortage, fearing that Russia could cut off supplies if Western countries refused to make payments in rubles. It is important to stress that the security of supplies guarantee that all contracts are being fulfilled and that the gas and oil are arriving in Germany as planned. It is therefore a preventive or precautionary decision that I took today. Although it has been announced that the Russian measure will take effect as of this Thursday, March the 31st, Moscow has shown signs that there is a possibility of negotiation. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said that the requirement to pay for gas in rubles would not be immediate and stated that from a technical point of view, this is a longer process. At a time that for Western Europe there is this risk and we do not know to what extent they will be able to sustain these disputes, to what extent they are preparing the energy field to adopt some kind of policies from now on. Because if they really decide not to use the rubles, the possibility of Putin's government to paralyze trade for a while is real. Even if the decision would also affect the Russian economy, this actually gives Russia a very relevant strategic power which has been used not only in the political field, as this is the form of political pressure to try to prevent the European Union from carrying out more sanctions or adopting more aggressive positions towards Russia. But it also has an economic bias, that of the Russian monetary expansion. While Russia and the European Union are measuring forces over gas, a new round of negotiations between the Russian and Ukrainian delegations took place in Istanbul. On Tuesday, the 29th, the meeting presented the most significant progress since the beginning of the war in Ukraine, with the announcement that Moscow would reduce combat operations near Kyiv.
Chinese President Xi Jinping called on the European Union on Friday to work for a steady and sustained growth of China EU relations and to add stabilizing factors to a turbulent world. The Asian head of state made the remarks in, the Beijing, in Beijing via video link in a meeting with the presidents of the European Council, Charles Michel, and the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. Leaders of both sides agreed that this has been an in-depth discussion in which the two sides reached common understandings in many areas. They agreed to step up communication and exchanges and keep up coordination and cooperation. In Spain, Alberto Núñez Feijó has been proclaimed this Saturday as the new president of the Popular Party with the support of 98.45% of the votes for the next general elections. The new leader of the Conservative was elected with the vote in favor of 2,619 delegates attending the elections held in Sevilla this Saturday, where Feijó was the only candidate in the Congress of Popular Power. After his election, the Galician Baron stressed that his mandate will be based on a more focused dialogic and pragmatic position than that of his predecessor. It should be noted that this conclave was convened to find a successor for the former leader Pablo Casado, who was forced to retire from power due to several demands after ordering an investigation for alleged corruption against the president of the community of Madrid, Isabel Díaz Ayuso. And we have more news coming up after this financial break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. This Saturday Ramadan festivities begin around the world, one of the most important dates in the Muslim calendar. The holiday falls in the ninth month of the Muslim lunar year, which this year is during the period between the 2nd of April and May. According to the Gregorian calendar, during this month, Muslims commemorate the day on which the Prophet Muhammad received the first revelation of the Quran, the holy book of the Islamic religion. During this celebration, believers practice patience and humility through prayer and fasting from dawn to sunset. During this festival, in addition to the call to fast, they also urge abstinence from committing or practicing acts contrary to Muslim morality. In South Africa, President Cyril Ramaphosa made a statement on last July riots that rocked the cities of Durban and Johannesburg. Ramaphosa told the South African Human Rights Commission that the unrest sought to cripple the economy and weaken the democratic state. The riots began as protesters after Ramaphosa's predecessor, Jacob Zuma, was jailed for a contempt of court over his refusal to testify before corruption investigations. The unrest left more than 350 dead and cost the economy some 50 billion rand. More than 2,500 people were initially arrested, mostly for minor charges. Zuma was released on health grounds a few weeks after the riots. One of his corruption trials is scheduled to begin on April 11th. Prices of food are going up in many countries in North Africa and the Middle East. In Egypt, as Ramadan begins and spending rises to local currency lost 17% of its value. The country is a leading importer of wheat from Ukraine and Russia. The conflict between the two countries is affecting the supplies. The local authorities started implementing ways of stabilizing the economy. The Egyptian government already started talks at the International Monetary Fund over a new assistance package, the third in six years. People's joy in welcoming Ramadan is different this year, as this is the second Ramadan after COVID-19. Yes, some prices are rising a bit and are different from other places, but people are shopping because they are happy that Ramadan is here and that the once a year season has arrived. Yes, the prices might be higher, but the people are shopping for Ramadan goods, like every year because they like to do something new and be happy as they welcome Ramadan. And we have come to the end of this news brief. For more, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching. Pakistani journalist Tariq Ali analyzes the international media influence driven by the empire. 
acts as an analysis of political, economic, and social life throughout Latin America through our stream and website in English. A critical space committed to truth to determine the conjuncture that moved the world today. The world today. Mondays.